Good morning. Good morning. I would like to call the meeting to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. Other individuals in the media may also be audibly and or visually recording this meeting. As well, a reminder that all electric, electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to today's agenda? Madam Chair, there are no changes, but you'll note that item 8.2, which is the delegation from Tom Hunter, CEO of City Housing Hamilton, has an added uh, presentation before you. And uh, item 10.3, the follow-up performance audit report 2013-13, Employee Paid Parking Value for Money Audit, AUD uh, 2000-20002, has a revised Appendix E, and it is also before you. Thank you, and everyone is in receipt of those. Um, we require an electronic vote to approve the agenda as presented. Councillor Clark, Councillor Pearson. All those in favour? Carried, thank you. Declarations of interest, are there any this morning? Hearing none. Item four, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. We require an electronic vote to approve the minutes of January the 16th. A mover and a seconder, Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Pearson. All those in favor? Carries. We have no communication items. Uh, public hearings. We have two this morning, to my knowledge. Um, I would like to call Fardad Shador Shabshi, respecting water billing charges. Good morning. Welcome. Um, sir, just a reminder, you have five minutes, and you'll see the time on the screen in front of you. Good day, my name is Farda Chador Shabchi. The property address would be 1182-1186 Cannon Street East Hamilton. Well, um, uh, the reason I'm here, first of all, thanks for having me. The reason I'm here is that I uh, like to let you know that uh, water uh, portion uh, was pushed down and then it was blended with my property taxes. And uh, right now, the water that I um, was a lower price, but I was told that I shouldn't pay for it uh, since it was under investigation with the uh, uh, Van Fort uh, City of Hamilton Water Department. But uh, it was such agony to have uh, all the departments and entities um, to get an update about the information of the uh, issue that I had. So the issue was uh, the water meter on the outside, the reader that wasn't reading right and it was broken and I was being charged triple amount which is flat rate uh, over since uh, September 2019 um, sorry September 2018 till April 2019 so the total amount up to date is 1,232.07 that's the water portion of my uh, taxes uh, that was, like I said, was blended with the property taxes and the 771.81 is what's left out of only the property tax that I need to pay um, from 2019 taxes uh, out of 4,563.68. That is the total amount of my 2019 taxes. So um, other than 771.81, that is the um, property taxes, um, I uh, the water portion that was triple amount with uh, penalties and taxes and interest and all that in would be 1,1232.07 um, that's left from 2019. And uh, I was hoping that I could uh, bring my message across and then uh, let you know that um, uh, I did uh, Back, did back and forth between the city of Hamilton and then uh, the uh, Wentworth City of Hamilton Water Department, and uh, they called the technician. Uh, well, I called Horizon Utilities, and they sent a technician from uh, Neptune Technologies. And this technician uh, attended 12th of March 2019, but apparently he couldn't fix the problem. So again, I had to go back to Wentworth. And uh, I had meeting with a bunch of people every each time, and uh, the 
the problem wasn't solved. And I was still told that I shouldn't, um, well, they were still investigating the problem. And while waiting, all the tax and penalties and interest kept adding on top. So right now, what I'm, again, I repeat the numbers, 1,212, uh, 1,232.07 is what I need to pay, which is the water portion of my 2019 taxes that I'm appealing it to the uh, audience, to the committee, see if they can, uh, you know, uh, do something about it, hopefully. Um, and um, which is the triple amount, which is the flat rate. And I have the bills to prove you that my water bill every month is $60 to $80. So um, what it was charged was two, over 200, 220, 230, and they were not realistic numbers. And the last time I went to Wentworth uh, Water Department, two ladies, uh, they were insisting that those are my consumption. But back in the day, I only had two tenants on the property. No, um, when my right now or past um, five six bills that I've been receiving from sixty to eighty dollars, I have four tenants on the on the property. So with four tenants, it's not realistic. If I had only two tenants with over two hundred dollar water bill, that they were trying to convince me that that was the consumption, where I have four tenants now with sixty dollar to eighty dollar monthly. Uh, water uh, bill, which I have uh, to show you if I'm required to. And um, I very much appreciate for having me again. I hopefully all these numbers are recorded and um, you can maybe um, have these uh, numbers considered and see what you can best do for me at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What's going to happen now is yep. we have some uh, members of the committee who would like to ask you some questions. And then after that, there'll probably be questions of staff because sure. we have a report on, um, on this case, okay? Yep. So I'm going to turn to Councillor Vanderbeek. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I have a question for the delegator, I would uh, just like to clarify something. So. So 8.1 is a letter from um, the homeowner. 8.1A is from staff, is that correct? Yes, my understanding. Has the homeowner seen 8.1A? Um, That's my first question. The second question is, is 8.1A about this property? Yes, 8.1A is with respect to this property. And I'm going to consult with uh, the clerk to ensure that the um, resident has seen the report. Well, it gets published online, so yeah. it was published last Wednesday uh, at noon. The entire agenda is is uh, uploaded. Okay. And way. this was in it. Yes, correct. Thank you. So through you, Madam Chair, to um, to the homeowner, have you read 8.1a? I think he's having a look at it right now. Okay. So so if you could just turn that over. Just flip it over. So at the bottom, are you aware that you were credited 1461.51 no, for your reversal of estimated billings, including interest? Uh, since I called the city of Hamilton today before my arrival here, uh, they mentioned um, what I owe and how much was the total of the taxes. And I still owe 2003 uh, to the city of Hamilton, which... Uh, uh, based on what I paid and what the total was of the taxes, um, I, I only would have $771 left to pay just the property tax portion. 1,013, uh, sorry, 1,1232.07 would be just on extras. I don't know what and, and they so said it's the water portion. As well. And through you, Madam Chair, my understanding here, and I'll just ask staff to, to um, confirm it, is that your, your bills continue to, to accrue, and when they weren't paid, $884 went to your taxes, but there was still $473 left owing. And they continued to accrue while they sorted it out. Once they got it sorted out, they reversed on your billings, Fourteen hundred and sixty-one fifty-nine fifty-one, which left you with a credit of forty sixty-six on your water bill, and then that paid your forty sixty-six. Oh no, sorry, 
and then to the tax roll, they transferred 4066. So just let me just put that through the chair to staff. Is that correct? Um, we'll have some leniency in terms of questions of staff. Brian or John? Who would, John will be answering that, um, Councillor Vanderbeek. Okay, so, so it's on the public record. Yep. So I'm just trying to explain to him where I think he still owes on the taxes because they didn't put it on the tax bill. They put it. They put the credit on your water bill, which meant you didn't have to pay that money on your water bill. So you will still have to pay the money that went to your tax bill because they've already given you back the money by putting it on your water bill. Is that correct, John? Through the chair, the chart on page two uh, of the 8.1 is the water count. It is not the property tax roll. Uh, and it obviously is exclusive of, le of electric as well. So what this is showing is what's happened on the water account since the, uh, the property was assumed. So uh, the account was open in January 19, not in uh, August of 2018 when he purchased the property because uh, Electra was not made aware by, uh, by the property owner or his lawyer to open up the account. So they were still billing the previous owner from August of 2018 until January of 2019. When the vendor's lawyer actually contacted Electra and made him aware of the change of ownership, what they immediately did, of course, was take the billing off of the previous owner and, and applied it to this account. So you see all these charges. They were on an estimated basis of two cubic meters per day um, because there was a touchpad issue. There's no doubt about that. So you can see in the chart, so they opened up the account on January 19th. They transferred over all the estimated billings from September of 18 to January 19, continued to, uh, continued to bill on estimates. And so the uh, property owner would have received bills that indicate that they were being based on an estimated, on an estimated basis. So you see there in February, March, the bills continue to happen. Uh, no payment was made on that uh, January uh, amount. And therefore, there was a tax fraud transfer on April 11th in accordance with our rears policy. It was 60 days post due. Um, so we have estimated billings in April, and there was even an, an interest charge there. Uh, at that point, the touchpad had been repaired by the city's uh, contractor, Neptune Technologies. They were there on March 12th. The, so what uh, Letra's practice is to do in that situation is now they have an actual reading. They reversed in its entirety the estimated billings, which you can see there. And then the net difference turned out to be, turned out to be $40.66. Since there wasn't the uh, balance still remaining on the water account, their practice would be to transfer it over to the, to the tax account. So that's, that's in a nutshell what's, what's happened there. Thank you. And so through you, Madam Chair, actually, the property owner has received credit, so had an amount owing removed from his account that includes anything that would have been transferred over to your tax account, but it stays on your tax account because they can't take it off. But you've already got credit for that money. So instead of paying the water bill, you'll pay it on your taxes. Can I just, um, so can I come up with the numbers just to sum up? Oh, so I'm just going to suggest okay. that you meet with city staff now okay. to have that explained to you so that you understand that you did get your money back. It's, it's just transferred over to a different place where you have to pay now that, but you got the money to pay, you got the value of that in a different way. So, so I'm just going to suggest that rather than we take time in this meeting for everybody, including okay, yeah, the sure. TV, yeah. to hear the explanation and to, so you can understand it, that you get together with um, city staff, the water staff, and have them explain to you exactly what happened. Yeah, when we're done, when the meeting's over. Okay, we, we, all right, thank you. Are you... Uh... So uh, thank you, and thank you for coming. This thank does you. give you an opportunity to, to have that explained to you properly. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pearson. Um, Madam Chair, and thank you, sir, for coming. And hopefully staff will clarify it's all been resolved. But just so you know for yourself that a lot of this was created by your lawyer not contacting the Water Department to have your name changed on the billing from the previous owners. 
So I, I did uh, uh, take a step forward, and once I uh, purchased the property, I did call them right away. And uh, That's not what they're showing here. But you can take it offline with staff. I just want you to know, because we staff are very diligent being sure things are, are um, um, caught through processes, but yeah. if lawyers don't let them know what's happening, they can't do anything. Well, my lawyer stopped uh, contacting me, and I even I contacted my lawyer, well, that's, I don't know what the issue of communication was, but uh, no matter how many messages I left him, he didn't respond. So, I don't know. That's so, deal I, with I, staff on the credit, and hopefully you're on your way to uh, um, proper water billings. Yeah, Thank sure. you. No problem. Thanks. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, staff are going to be occupied for a little bit, so if you have time to, to wait, and when they're available, they'd be happy to meet with you and go through the details. Thanks for having me again. Thank you very much. To receive by Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Partridge. All those in favor? Carried. Okay. Thank you again. Um, we are on to item 8.2. Um, sorry, Madam Clerk. Sorry, uh, Madam Chair, if we can just uh, also uh, receive the staff supporting documentation. Beg your pardon. Um, may I have a motion to receive the supporting documentation moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek? All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item 8.2, we have Mr. Tom Hunter, the CEO of City Housing Hamilton. He is here. Good morning. Respecting a request for abatement for a water leak at 25 Tower Crest Drive. Thank you, Mr. Hunter, for being with us this morning. As I'm sure you know, there are five minutes allotted for your delegation. Through the chair. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present on City Housing Hamilton's request for abatement for a major water leak. The uh, first slide was just some information about City Housing Hamilton, our 1,200 plus properties. Just a bit of information on 25 Tower Crest Drive, where the uh, drive where the break occurred. Uh, just around the detection, want to ensure we knew about this in November the 11th. And then a contractor was sent out, inspection of the internal units, and then an inspection done on the property with drawings. And then it was determined uh, the leak was under unit 48 under the driveway. The contractor repaired it. And then in December, uh, City Housing Hamilton contacted city staff uh, regarding this issue and uh, potential recourse. Just wanted to point out that around detection, there was no evidence of surface water. The contractor confirmed that the water was seeping into the crevices of bedrock, and Hamilton Water later confirmed that the water did not enter the city's sanitary or storm sewer systems. Just a bit on the consumption history at this property, typically the water bill is 4,300, and what we saw from February to December in 2019 was roughly 50,000 a month for a total of uh, just over $500,000. What we wanted to share uh, also around uh, the, the consumption and with our utilities, with the invoicing, with the changing from Horizon to Electra, and also we had a temporary staff member who started at that time when, when the break occurred. Here is the uh, January bill with Horizon where you can see the pattern, spikes, ebbs and flow in the water bill. When, then when we look at February, this is when we first see the heightened amount of, of 14,000. This is still with the horizon with a, a bit of history there, but 14,000, that would be within what we, ranges that we see on our larger properties. And then this is when it converted from horizon to Electra. This is where we see there's no longer any history for the staff to, to look at. And this is in March, and this is the first time that it went up to that number of 47,000 and then subsequently around 50,000 per month. And these we just showed what uh, we put these before you to see just the continued pattern over the months. I did internal, of er, internal controls, did want to highlight that uh, Elector did call it, contact uh, the city of Hamilton on, on two different occasions. We have looked at the, the, the phones where they came into, we looked back at the, the Electra phone numbers and we are still trying to reconcile with Electra about the phone calls and specifically who and when they were made. If uh, there's any you know, follow-up required with staff, we will we'll work with uh, labor relations on required action. Also, there was two written notices which came into City Housing Hamilton and uh, on April and then in June. 
And for us, this is difficult to trace. We can't trace this from the perspective that at any time we have two people on reception. There's people who cover for breakfast, uh, breakfast sorry, for uh, lunches and for breaks and an illness. And so from when these came into reception and determining where they went, that's a, a challenge. And I shut it off. There we go, got it back. And just mentioned a bit more internal controls, we, the bills were paid. The other, uh, I just want to mention that in terms of also invoices, it was utilization reports. And with the change from uh, um, Horizon to Electra, we were no longer uh, receiving those usage reports. And so we once again, uh, from that audit perspective, we couldn't see what was happening at 25 Tower Crest. This slide just goes a bit more into that information with, uh, with the usage reports. And I think it's all, then it's important for us, most important to look at what is our follow-up action plan from this. We are moving to uh, electronic fund transfers. This has been happening for quite some time. We do and will very shortly have all of these utility reports reconciled with uh, Electra. We were working on those over 2019. Notices will be coming into one individual and then being distributed and recorded. And also once we have the usage reports, we'll be able to do uh, quarterly reviews with finance and administration and the policy to follow up. Our request for abatement because the leaking water ended up in the bedrock and likely did not enter the city's sanitary or storm sewer systems. The amount, uh, half, roughly half of that bill is $237,812. We also are working with our insurance company as well for recovery of the excess water bill compo component. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Hunter, for that. Um, are there any, qu there are questions. Councillor Collins of the delegate. I really don't have any questions. I have comments that I want to make, so I, maybe I can wait until questions are asked of Tom, and then I can speak at that time. Councillor Clark. Council, this is a bit challenging because city housing is, is one of our, our family here. Um, but if you were anyone else coming in and electorate indicated that they sent phone messages to you on two dates, and then notification letters on two dates, and but you didn't deal with it until December of 2019, which is six months after the letters and 12 months after the phone calls, we'd be saying, how is this our problem? So I'd have to ask that question, so I'm gonna have to ask you that question. Uh, uh, through the chair, we simply, uh, we, you know, this is what had occurred, had transpired with us. I had indicated uh, the, the uh, with the, with the calls that were received, uh, we, we can't, right now, we haven't been able to trace specifically what happened. We, we can work a bit more with Electra on that. But, and then in, in the, the uh, we didn't even realize until uh, December, uh, sorry, November, that this had occurred. And so that's where we're having to go back to look at this. And the same with the, uh, with the written notifications. And what's, uh, in just a bit more detail around those notifications, <coughs> when we realized that, uh, you know, that, if this part, what, what had occurred, and we need to put corrective measures in place, we are looking at now at going through one individual to, uh, not, to prevent that from happening again. I can't judge your management protocols, but two letters coming in, and you're saying that they got caught somewhere between reception and getting transferred to the people that actually should be dealing with them. I, again, I don't understand how that can happen. I mean, this is a significant amount of money that you're asking us to offset, and I understand um, the challenges. But if you were any other organization, we would really be questioning how, again, how it, why should the taxpayers be paying for that when you were giving notice verbally and given notice in written form, and yet nothing happened until the end of that year? It, it just seems that there's an issue in the organization, and now you're asking us to, to compensate for that issue. Yes, uh, through the chair. Yes, with uh, recognizing that you know th this 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 occurred with both the written notice and the the uh, the um, calls. You know we. Once again, though, it, there was, as I said, the, the leak was undetected. We, we didn't know in other circumstances it may be just a short period of time before we're made aware of it, and, and we, can, we can address this. That was you know, an extenuating circumstance in this case, 
and also with the, with the usage reports, we didn't have that information to even audit, to cross-reference what was happening on the, on the invoice side. I'm really struggling with this one, Madam Chair. I, I truly am. Yes, indeed. Councillor Ferguson. Yes, thank you. And, and, and Tom, I had the same questions that uh, Councillor Clark had. If you get written notification from an electoral alerting you there's something going on and no action was taken for nine months, and you know, somebody it must have raised somebody's eyebrows when your water bill went from $4,300 a month to $56,000 a month for nine months. You know, if the clerk didn't realize that he was processing your accounts payable, the ultimate control is the guy signing the check. He would look at that and say, what the heck's going on? You know, why, why suddenly has it gone up by 10 times, more than 10 times, and, and start asking questions? Do you have those kind of controls where there's a manager who signs the checks, who typically would catch that sort of thing by saying this doesn't look right? Uh, th through the chair, so the way that the process currently works, that, that, that's, not, that, that's not the way it works. So the, the bill would come in to reception, it goes up to, to finance, and then the bills are paid in, in finance. And as I had mentioned, it was a temporary person who came in March, so hadn't really any knowledge around, around the, the accounts and the amounts, and then they're, 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 they're paid at that point. So there's nobody who signs a check then? So what, no senior so person when, when, the, when, the, when the batch is submitted for, for payment, there are two signatures on that. But it's a batch, so I could have been one of the person, people who signed off on that. It can be roughly whatever, you know, how many hundreds of thousands for that month. So it's all okay. batched together, so you don't see them individually. You don't see the checks individually? You don't, it's, it's all rubber stamped on the signatures, is it? Or is there somebody actually signed their name to it? Yes, yeah, I, I would be one. Of, I could be one of the people, or one of the managers. Okay, something. because in, in my previous life, we always had the manager sign the checks, and they would spot that this doesn't look right, and just start asking questions, and and that's the ultimate control is signing the check. And it, to the chair, moving moving forward, the the, the process it, it still would be a batch, the electronic fund transfer payment. It is a batch, but uh, for payment for that, where the where the check and balance comes in is with the, with the usage report and looking at what's occurring there from a cost and volume consumption with the invoices. Can you just pick your microphone up a bit? Oh, I'm sorry, there you go. And, and so um, the way your system works then, you would get a batch which would be a printout of a series checks and you would sign off in that batch and then it would be electronically transferred? Is that right. how your system right. works? Right, right. Okay. And so you don't have a manager before he signs off that glance down this to say, does this make sense? Uh, through the chair. So when it was, let's say in the utilities bill, if there's other, you know, when I'm signing, I, I can at points routinely look through, you know, some of the background information for these batch payments. I just, you know, it, it's not very typical though to go by, to go through each one. Okay. I'm struggling also. I'm anxious to hear what Councillor Collins says because he is the chair of your board and can get his comments on it. So uh, I'll wait for that. Thank you. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Tom. Um, I too, I'm, I'm really struggling and surprised uh, of, of the way the whole process of this went. And I guess my questions are, firstly, I mean, how many facilities are City Hamilton housing? I don't know how many facilities. We've never had this happen before. So we, we have uh, 1,200 properties, so you, put, you would have potentially 1,200 uh, invoices coming in. And we, we do receive uh, notification about high, the, no, the, the notice uh, about high usage regularly. That's a regular occurrence, and then it's, it's followed up. Um, but it, it, but it's, it's usually visible, and it, uh, you know, it's addressed immediately. This, this was one that you know, clearly was of significant proportion. But it went to over $40,000 a month for, what, 11 months? Right. How did, that's significant, you're, getting, you're absolutely right. So how did it get, I don't understand how it could have gotten overlooked. I, I, I'm, I'm really at a loss to see how somebody didn't pick up this statement. And I understand your question, your, your, your comment with regards to the changeover from the Electra or from Horizon to the electric billing and you didn't have a history. I don't know that, did, it, did a history matter when you see a, a number bounce out of you? That's like, 
uh, multiple times that you normally pay? Uh, so through, through the chair, that was there was also a point, unfortunately, that there was a, a new temporary clerk from an agency who started that. So when they would have the payments in March, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have known what that history was. They wouldn't have known that at the amount. So when that kind of collectively comes together, it, it's it's not uh, noticed. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. And I too am curious of what Councillor Collins' uh, points are going to be as um, I think chair of the Hamilton Housing. And um, you know this is very very unfortunate. Either way, our taxpayers pay on this no matter what. So, um, but it's very frustrating that something like this for this length of time when we have residents that come in. And, you know, we pretty well turn them away, say, no, you know, you were given the notice, we have a process, and everybody should follow the process. So I'll certainly like to hear what Councillor Collins says. Councillor Collins, you have the floor. Thanks, Madam Chairman. And, of course, all the questions that you've had are those that I had last month when I got the call from staff. And I, you know, and sorry, if you allow me to make comments, I, I really don't have any questions of Tom. So if, if there's an opportunity for us to let, okay. Would I quit? Sure. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Sorry, Councillor, I just, so when, when I was on my, my first term here, I served on the board and there was a monthly statement that came to the board of all the checks that were issued. Is that still a practice? Uh, through the chair, no, it's not. So there isn't a list of, of the checks coming to the board or to senior management of all the checks that are being issued? Uh, through the chair, no. A real lack of checks and balances. I'm really disappointed. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you. Uh, Tom, thanks for coming in this morning. Um, my question is, could you just expand a bit on, and I know in your, you've got follow-up action plan here in your, in your presentation, but could you just, uh, in light of the questions being asked, could you just give us an idea of how you're going to, <coughs> excuse me, tighten up the procedures going forward. Um, you know, I've heard that nothing now comes to the board. I don't know when that was stopped, but if you could just expand on how you're gonna prevent this from happening in the future. Uh, uh, through the chair, so uh, first of all, as it relates to the, from, uh, the usage reports from an audit report perspective, we are very close with Electra to getting all of the accounts kind of reconciled when the conversion was made. It's been worked on throughout 2019. So as of the end of February into March, we will have those usage reports that we will look at consumption and, and cost with finance and administration. On the, uh, on the notification, what we will be doing with the notification, um, when it would come to, to reception that with the policy, the standard operating procedure will reflect that the, uh, that will be sent to the operations assistant, the manager of operations assistant, and then that individual will document that, and that notice will then be, uh, that call will then be forwarded to the property manager and appropriately followed up so that we don't uh, miss either the, the voice or the, the written notification. So those are some of the, 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 the key mechanisms that would be put into place to help with that. Okay, and I, and I'm, I may have missed, but when a notification comes in or a call comes in, it, who is the contact that elector has? You don't have to give me names, but in, in terms of position. Right. So, when we looked at the doc, uh, the chair, when we looked at the documentation, it said a call went into the city. We're not even sure whether it directly went to the city or us. But anyway, there was. They did indicate who. Uh, they did, they just said that they. But they did speak to somebody who knew. When we looked at what was actually written at the, about that site. Um, but in the future, that call, we have contacted Electra, and that will call will go directly to one person so that it won't be, it won't be uh, you know, just to uh, that uh, okay. possibility for others. So, so ha having heard that there was a temporary person in there and the person that would normally be there wasn't there, how do you prevent that from happening in the, in, in the future? And, and so my, my thinking is, is a call like that better to go to um, either yourself or a director or a CFO, someone like that? Uh, through, through the chair, that, that can be possible. Uh, and we, you know, this was our starting point in, from, the, from the policy. Uh, and I can't speak to the actual numbers of those that, right. that we might receive, but that, but, that is, that, but that aside, that's certainly something to consider. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking the numbers under consideration are $237,000. Yeah. And that number is a significant number. 
Um, I may have a question for staff, but um, I'll, I'll, that's, that's it for now. Thank you, Tom. to receive Councillor Collins, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you very much, Tom, for being here. I know Councillor Collins wanted to uh, speak to the, to the matter, and I know there are questions of staff. So, Councillor Collins. Thanks, Madam Chairman. And, um, you know, ironically, housing has probably been, and I just bragged about this maybe two weeks ago at one of our committees, housing has been one of the biggest beneficiaries from a budget perspective around this council table. We've consistently invested in housing well above the increases that other areas of the organization are receiving. And so when you look at budgets over the last three to five years, in particular, housing, maybe you could put transit in that category as well, have probably been the two areas where council has made significant, the most investments from a capital and operating perspective. Ironically, the investments that we've made in housing um, are in the energy conservation and water consumption areas. We've received significant provincial grants at all of our properties, we have gravitated, as many of you know, to LED lighting. We've worked on all of our HVAC systems and boilers and upgrades. We've also gravitated to low flush toilets, and all of that has helped us to reduce our energy consumption. So when I see something like this, um, you know, I I don't even know where to start. What in terms of in terms of dealing with our staff as it relates to relaying the disappointment because. We've made these investments to save money, and when we see something like this, it, it's cause for concern. And so we have yet, um, you're on the board as well at this point in time, we've yet to have our first board meeting in terms of being able to drill down and, and deal with this. I did ask Tom the other day to send a, a message to our board members to make them aware of the presentation and the circumstances around it. I say all of that in the context of I understand fully the whole issue of the water break and how it went undetected. I've been to this committee twice over the last probably two terms with private condominiums in terms of the same scenario. Water break happens, it's on the property somewhere, it's undetected. It takes, in those circumstances that I dealt with and had here before committee, maybe two to three months at most in terms of the break occurs, shows up on a bill, somebody raises a red flag, but then it's fixed by a contract. The fact that it would take us eight months to nine months to go through that when it should take two to three is concerning. So I can say that um, we will deal with this from an HR perspective. Um, I can say that our board will have a lot of discussion about standard operating procedures. I'm, I'm not aware of checks coming to boards. I've sat on probably 20 or 30 boards in my time at the city. It doesn't happen here, it doesn't happen at the Conservation Authority, it doesn't happen at housing. So we're not, we don't drill down that much we do, however, receive key performance indicators as it relates to energy consumption, vacancies, um, arrears, those types of things. So this will be caught at some point in time in our key performance indicators when it's presented to the board. And I think from the perspective of financials, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to, to justify providing a reimbursement for it. We've paid it. Um, and it's not just the money that's here in front of us in terms of the ask. We've paid for the water consumption as well. So it's double, it's double what's in front of us. You know, the request here today is to assist with the sewer charge. There's a water charge that we paid that we're not asking for relief and that's been paid. So it really, it's counterproductive to all the things that we've done in terms of making investments, especially in this area. So it is a difficult issue for me to deal with personally. You know, I, I find myself having trouble supporting it. And um, for the other two that have been here, I think we granted them two to three months of relief on the sewer part, not on the water. Um, so those would be my comments at this point. Um, I, I don't have a recommendation to provide to the committee. I've heard the comments. I have the same questions and concerns that you've raised, and we will deal with this at our board. Councillor Ferguson, did you have a question of staff or a yeah, comment? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, the item in uh, the report form is eight two. Okay, uh, so my question to staff is after hearing the, the chair of the board's comments, that uh, he's also struggling with this. Um, typically, sometimes in these situations, we provide interest-free loans or loans to 
the corporation that get paid back over time. Is that something we can do? You don't need it? I think the... You have enough money in reserve? The chair of the uh, housing corporation. There's Mike on here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we've we've paid these bills as they've come in. It's not uncommon for us to have very large bills like this. So, in, you know, in Tom's defense, to an extent, we we have to the average person to see a bill like this would be absolutely shocking. For us, we have such large properties that these numbers are not uncommon on some of them. So that let's state that. From a, from a payment perspective, we paid it, and I believe we've yet to see our year in numbers. We will be under budget because of many of the things I just talked about. Low flush even though you paid this? Even though we paid it. So low flush toilets, the energy consumption we've saved on LED lights. All those investments we've made have paid huge dividends. So I, I certainly, I, that's probably a good question for Tom in terms of year end. We haven't received that yet. Of course, it'll come later in the spring. Uh, but probably a question for Tom in terms of where we're at from a budget perspective. I didn't ask that question, but we've been trending for most of the year under budget. Can I put that question through to Tom then, Madam Chairman? I think it would be uh, beneficial. Tom, Tom, Tom if you've you got enough money to pay the bill? Uh, through the chair, currently City Housing Hub is in a, a favorable position for year end. And we'd just like to add that with these efficiencies that Councillor Collins was erasing utilities and investments that we've made over the past two years. We've seen um, a $1.5 million reduction in our utilities across our province uh, pro uh, properties. And, and subsequently, that has transpired into dollars available for an additional well, almost $1.5 million in maintenance. And well, that's very laudable. That's great that you're doing that. But you're telling us that despite the fact that you paid this extra water bill, you're still in a surplus situation. Through the chair, yes. And then, Madam Chairman, I suspect what we do is simply receive this presentation, and it seems like there's capacity to handle it. And, you know, if we give relief to our own operators, what do we do to the individuals that show up at the podium? And uh, so it'd be difficult to say also. My suggestion would be we simply receive the presentation, and that's the end of it. Councillor Partridge. Uh, yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, my question, though, through you to Tom, Tom is, uh, and, to, and to staff as well. Um, is there any, uh, any um, plans to do an audit of the system? Uh, you know, we've had uh, leaks ourselves in other areas, and I'm just wondering if that is something that could be done, should be done, or is currently being contemplated, is, is going through. And I realize there's a lot of properties, but I'm just thinking that perhaps an audit of some of the larger properties for any potential leaks. I mean, this is... This is uh, you know, not a one-off, I'm sure. There's going to be others. A system question for you, Mr. Hunter. Uh, through the chair, as I, as I mentioned, I, for, for when we would, we would look at this from the information from the usage port that, re, that we would see, that would be our, our auditing process, to, you know, working with Electra, with those usage reports to see, you know, what was the consumption of the different properties? Was there any significant variances that we would have to investigate? So moving forward, that's certainly from an audit perspective. You know, our strategy and that would involve both our operations and finance staff to ensure that there's kind of continuity within those two areas. So I appreciate that being uh, an audit chair of the actual financial system. I'm talking about the mechanical system. I'm talking about the mechanics. If that is something that um, uh, staff could work with city housing on or has it been contemplated uh, or is it even possible? Zagarek? So through the chair, it, it may be worth having a conversation with corporate facilities. It's my understanding that they have business solutions whereby they take the uh, transactional and usage information and it uh, feeds into a, a business solution, a IT platform, and flags where there are, uh, um, you know, variances, significant variances, so that they can take timely action. So that may be worthy of a conversation with corporate facilities to see whether or not a, you know, it could be a service level agreement with corporate facilities if they have capacity to provide support, or B is just sharing that knowledge and information as to how they are using technology to help to flag these occurrences. Again, uh, that's something that just comes to mind. No, and I appreciate that, Mike. I think getting, you know, corporate um, facilities even to have that conversation uh, they do become involved in city housing properties. Can you confirm that? I'm seeing yes. 
Through the chair, uh, I know in the past they provided some support. I think, as, as uh, Councillor Collins and Tom have referenced, is uh, I think they've been par party to previous conversations around retrofits. Uh, but again, uh, I'm not sure how involved they are today. Okay, thank you. And that may ultimately be a decision of the board, but um, I'll just put it out there and, and perhaps take it as direction just for a follow up conversation. Thank you. Councillor Clerk. Just some quick comments. So, given that the organization has the surplus to cover it and that the board hasn't even dealt with it, I'm not even sure how it came here as a request for an abatement before this committee prior to the board even have an opportunity to review it. So, is that something that I'd suggest that the board take up? Um, and in terms of standard operating procedures, um, we have an excellent audit division. You can always reach out to the audit division to assist in the formation of the standard operating procedures to prevent problems like this from happening in the future. There's no recrimination when they do that. They're happy to assist in any way possible. So that, that may assist also in making sure that you haven't missed something that, that might pop up in a future date. So those would be my comments. Good luck. Ferguson? Well, I, was, I was going in the same direction. I was going to ask a question to Charles. Charles, in my experience in the private sector, particularly where you have electronic deposits happening, there's an, what's called an exception report, and you program it in. So if someone happens to get a check for $150,000 instead of $1,500, it would kick out as an exception report that somebody would look at. Are those, are those programs used now by our public works department or other areas of the city? Is that something we could share with Hamilton Housing? Uh, through the chair, I, I can't give you specifics. Um, as Mike pointed out, uh, there are tools in place in, uh, throughout the city, but I think they're not, they're not universally used, uh, would be my assumption. And so there might be some merit in comparing uh, what city housing does in terms of its standard operating procedures with uh, what the best examples would be in the city, not necessarily universal, but I'd be, I'd be looking at seeing what are the best uh, tools available that are currently in use at the city and look for the best practices that occur. Okay, that so Madam Chairman, uh, I think it's a, the council's duty to look for these sort of things and then request an audit. And, and not just housing, but all areas. If this sort of thing snuck through where checks go up from, or payments go, up, go from 4,300 to $50,000 a month, we need an, so there should be an exception report generated. So uh, uh, I don't know, Madam Chair, maybe to Mike, how do we get, how do we request an audit of these systems or are you suggesting first we ask Rome to give us a, a comment on how he handles this in public works? Again, remembering this has not been heard by the board, but Mr. Zagarek? So through the chair, I'm just trying to respect the governance model here. And so it may be a, a a uh, recommendation or comment shared with the board and uh, from council to the board and allow the board and the officers of City Housing Hamilton uh, follow you, up. You let the board of Hamilton Housing make the suggestion then rather than us make the suggestion. Is that what you're, you're saying? So through the chair, uh, I'm assuming given that the chair of the board is, uh, is uh, in the room, I think the message is delivered. And so uh, my sense is that the board will follow up with, the, uh, with Tom and the management team. Okay, so Madam Chairman, that being the case, I'll, I'll leave it to Councillor Collins to deal with his board and start the process there too, because we want to avoid this thing not just happening in housing, but in other areas that if there's a big check going out, there should be an electronic means of sensing that and kick a, a report out to the president or the CEO or the, or those, or the general manager or the directors just so they can see there's something amiss here to start asking questions. So is it simply move to receive this presentation today then and that's it or we've already done that, we don't have to take any further actions? My sense is the will of the committee is to receive it and uh, the wish is that the board will uh, deliberate it accordingly. I'd, I'd be happy to move that. Moved by Councillor Ferguson. I beg your pardon, madam. Councillor Collins, second it. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to receive the supporting documentation from staff, which is 8.2A, moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. We're on to discussion items right now. We have item 10.1 in front of us. 
All of C11, a single source provider for TYMCO sweeper DST-4. We have a motion to move it from Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All those in favor? Oh, I beg your pardon, we have questions. Thank you, Thank you Clerk Angela. Councillor Clark. So, I, as I've always raised concerns about single sourcing and sole sourcing, so um, just can someone paraphrase for me, what's the justification for not going out to a competitive bid on something like this? How do we know that we're getting the best value for the taxpayers if we, do, if we don't test it? Mr. Zagarek or Mr. Soldo, who will help us today? Thank you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. I'll start, and uh, I'm sure Mike will chime in as required. Um, the purpose of the report before you today is that uh, we're looking to um, acquire one of these sweepers. Our entire fleet in the Transportation Operations and Maintenance Division, uh, we have 18 Tyco sweeper DST6s. They were approved by Council back in uh, 2006, and they were put on our standardization list so that we buy the same uh, vehicle has moved forward to ensure we have the similar parts, that we don't need to have multiple different uh, vehicles uh, back in 2017. The reason we're before you here today is that instead of buying the DST-6, we're looking to buy the version 4. Just the ver just, it's the same sweeper, it's just smaller, and it's going to be used for bike lanes and streets where we can't fit the DST-6. So uh, we're looking for uh, the uh, approval underneath policy 11, and we're also looking to add this item to our standardization list, which is recommendation number two. Um, this will allow us to have the same parts, have knowledge of how to maintain these vehicles. It's similar to the other ones we have, so we would have a consistent sweeper fleet. So if I may, I'd like to ask the auditor a question then. So the the rationale for the single source is the standardization, so that they have the same type of equipment over the same period on an ongoing basis and they've got the parts so that it's efficiency. My concern would be that if the manufacturer is aware that we're going to be buying these products because we've standardized them, that we may not be getting the most competitive price on the product. So have you tested whether or not such a standardization policy is efficient for the taxpayer? How do we know that they're not just jacking up the price now that they know we've made the decision only to buy this particular product? Mr. Brown? Uh, through the chair, I think just because you have um, this policy in effect, I think you still have to be prudent in your purchase and do some analysis of what the typical cost would be, just like if we were buying a car, right? So I, I, I don't buy the concept that if, if you have a policy it allows you to single source. You simply take the price that's asked. I think there has to be some due diligence, and if I were auditing it, I would look to see what kind of due diligence there was around analysis of the price. And so I guess now over to our procurement side, have we exercised any of that due diligence to verify that the prices have not miraculously gone up over time and we're we've compared the price of this particular product with other similar product on the marketplace. Tina. Through the chair, um, in speaking with the fleet services division, they did mention to me that um, they were going to have negotiations and, and look at the contract, and I believe there might be another extension available in the contract. I cannot be sure, I don't have the contract at me, um, in front of me, but um, they were going to, they had scheduled meetings soon, and that this would be part of that, uh, those discussions to ensure that they did get a comparative price. Um, with respect to looking at the market, uh, Fleet Division bring forward their standardization list every year for committee and council approval. And as part of that, they are required to do some due diligence to ensure that the prices that they're getting and the equipment that they are setting forward on their standardization list is still required and it's still valid. So I guess to fleet then, so what test did we perform to ensure that we're getting value for our money on this particular proposal? 
Through the, um, you, Madam Chair, to the Councilor, my understanding is that Fleet looked at the cost of this vehicle and did a comparison to uh, other models, and particularly the model that uh, we've been buying, and it uh, does provide value. Yeah, I'm, I'm just nervous um, that the best intentions of creating a standardization for efficiency's sake, that over time we're actually losing not being competitive and we're, we're finding ourselves paying more than we should be. And I don't see anything in the report indicating exactly where the tests are that proves that has been done otherwise. So I have real concerns about this. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thank you. So to, you, to um, uh, whatever staff can answer this question. So we haven't publicly procured a sweet, please, uh, street sweeper since 2004. Did I hear that correct, or 2006? Am I, are you able to answer that? Through the chair, I can't be certain how many units we have bought in over the past years, but I believe that they do buy units from time to time. That's why they're on the standardization list. It's not like we just made a purchase back in 2004, 2006. Oh, I, I agree, I've, there's a lot of street sweepers out there. So we haven't public procured since 2004 street sweepers. Through the chair, I am unaware of any procurement. I would have to go back in the files, but in my time, I don't believe we have. Okay, so as, as our gatekeeper of purchasing, what are you doing to ensure we're buying proper value? You know, there's got to be other street sweeper manufacturers out there that you could get to bid on this, and you don't have to necessarily take the lowest bidder, but at least test the marketplace. Through the chair, we try to work with the client departments because really they are the expertise when it comes to units and, and so on and so forth. Um, but as the report talks to, uh, this particular sweeper has um, some filtering system and some capability that other uh, sweet sweepers do not have at, the, at this time in the market. So to be honest with you, we work with the fleet department, but procurement can assist in that, but we don't do any market research for fleet. Should How's be the doing? police department affected with street sweepers? Did you say police? Did I say police? Yeah, I oh, thought I heard police. Did I say police? Um, through the chair, I'm sorry, I apologize. I did not say police. Did I say What did you say? I can't remember. I'm sorry. You've said it twice. So you, you talk, did I? Did uh, I? I've heard police twice. I don't know what those heard, but... Uh, no, I, I didn't. The chair didn't hear it. But uh, your question is... Um, back to your question. My question is, how do you know we're buying value? And, you know, there's no question that street sweepers, as every other piece of heavy equipment, has emerged over time. And they may have been the first one out of the gate to have the filter system which protects the environment, which steered us in that direction 14 years ago, or um, 16 years ago. But that technology, I suspect, you know, is, is on all manufacturers, but we've never tested the market um, since 2004, I think I heard you say. You say you checked with the department. What department did you check with? Through the chair, that would be Fleet Services. Fleet, oh, okay. Fleet, fleet Services. Um, okay. I'm sure sole sourcing has bothered me for a long time. For those who sit on Public Works Committee, we get about one every meeting, and it's all about the standardization again, but the same issue sits, is how do we know we're buying value? And, and there's some... Merit to it when it comes to buying pumps for pumping stations because you got to service 169 stations all over the city and you want some standardization. But I would like to see us go out and, and do a public procurement and make sure that we're still buying value. Uh, um, it's just my own personal feelings. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and my question too was. Um, um, to Edward, um, did we get any comparison pricing? And I'm not sure, or we just, this is what we went for and that's what we got and that's the price we got. Um, through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor, this particular unit uh, performs a controlling uh, particulate in, in a very specific manner and it's, uh, 
It's certified with ETV Canada. Uh, in, in the uh, report itself, we speak to that it can pick up particulate at 90%. So there's not a lot of other, and I was just asking the question of my staff here, other sweepers that can provide that efficiency. Um, so that's one of the main reasons we standardized back then. Uh, Council wanted a, uh, uh, a sweeper that can meet that, that specific um, particulate matter uh, in terms of being able to pick it up. It, was, it came through the uh, Clearing uh, Air Hamilton report in 2006. So at that time, we wanted to have a certain uh, efficiency in the sweeper, and that's why we standardized on this particular one. It's my understanding uh, in speaking with staff that there isn't any other manufacturers to provide that type of sweeper. <clears throat> Thank you for that, but was I don't recall reading that. I know it says this is, you know, very sensitive, fine-tuned equipment. But it, was it stated in here that I, I don't remember reading that there is no other company that produces similar equipment out there. If I missed it, I apologize. Thank you, through, the Madam Chair, through you, Madam Chair, to, to the, the Councillor. Um, speaking with staff, there is no other uh, sweeper that provides that sort of efficiency. Yes, I appreciate that, but is, was it mentioned in the report? That could have given clarification of why we're going with this company again, not just because we're sole sourcing, because we have their units now in the DST6. So, my, so to you, Madam Chair, my apologies on, on the on the very last page in the top paragraph. None of the other sweepers meet the efficiency standards or remove 90% of the PM10 and PM2.5 particulates. Page four of four. Got it. Thank you. And I just because I didn't I didn't catch that. My apologies, um, Mike. I think you wanted to say something through you, Madam Chair. Mr. Zagarek. Through the chair, I was just going to highlight Thank the you. top paragraph. Okay. And um, so just if I could continue. So Edward, you're saying, and I understand because I think one of the biggest issues we have is inventory. And um, you know, when you start getting into different equipment, you have a whole bunch of parts that you have to start ordering and you, know, you end up having a backlog of parts for certain things that may never get pulled off the shelf and used. And then you've got a supply that obviously it's an inventory that taxpayers have paid for and it's just sitting there. So in this particular piece of equipment, you're saying that the parts are interchangeable. I'm assuming though the only difference is the, the chassis. Is that, would that be correct? So the motor's the same, the, the, the sweeper part is the same. All of the parts that we, can, we would need to get stock on are interchangeable. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, that, that's correct. It's not just the parts, but also the operations of the vehicle. If you buy a different Same. sweeper, now you need to uh, train staff to, to run different types of sweepers. So there's a lot of different uh, efficiencies you have by standardizing your fleet. And is the price that's in here, is it out of line to, um, obviously there is going to be a little bit out of line, but there should be a range as far as ones that may not have as, as, um, as fine a, a clearing as this one does. Some consultation going on, Mr. Soldor. Um, that, that's correct. This uh, we looking at this uh, vehicle. The DS six actually costs more. This is a smaller vehicle. It costs a little bit less. We put three hundred and ten in at this point, but as um, procurement has indicated, it is still to be negotiated. Thank you for those answers, Councillor Vanderbeek. For the first time. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple of my questions have already been answered, but um, so I'd just like to ask, Edward, through, through you, Madam Chair, um, do we fix these pieces of equipment in-house? Is the maintenance and, and the repair on these street, sweet, street sweepers on in-house? <laughs> Mrs. Bitter had some butter. She said this butter's bitter. You gotta get that street sweeper, <laughs> sweeper is a problem. <laughs> Uh, thank you, through, through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. Yes, uh, our fleet services uh, maintains these vehicles. Thank you. So, so it, it is incumbent on us to have parts for these vehicles and that they 
and that they're interchangeable. I understand that. My struggle is understanding how in 14 years we haven't gone out again to find out whether that standardization is still the best, um, cost, most cost-effective um, answer for the city. And I do understand what you're saying about it, it removing 90% of PM10 and PM2.5 particulates um, and various other things in this report, but it seems to me that we need some kind of a, a, a process that's, um, when, when people, People are looking at these reports and seeing single source, single source, single source. Um, it just seems to me that we should be able to point to a time when we tested that again and do it transparently. So that when we have a question about why is this single source and someone says, well, it's been on the list since 2006, and that's almost 15 years, that we should be able to point to a time when we tested that list. And maybe we do, maybe we have it, maybe we've done it, but it's not clear. And I think if, a, if something is coming to us, this is a general comment, as a single source, and, that's the, and those are the reasons why, because we've tested it, and we know that it's still the best purchase for the city, it's the best way to spend the taxpayer's dollar, and that's in the report, I would stop a lot of this dialogue. And so I, 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 I don't know who that's going to, but it's either you or Rick or Tina. So if somebody can address that, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Mayor. Uh, through the chair. Um, 2004 was the last time the city may have issued a procurement public process for street sweepers. But after that point in time, we did joint uh, purchasing with the City of Toronto for street sweepers. The process that was undertaken was very extensive. They rented a warehouse, they brought in the various models of the, of the manufacturers and they, they engaged a science scientific uh, firm to, to measure the pollution that was coming out and to measure the dust particulate that was, that was uh, kicked up after they uh, ran the regenerative uh, type Timco machines. And we brought that report back to council and got council to endorse buying Timco's, which came out of it as being the best for various reasons. Council was uh, very happy with that report and we can resurrect that, uh, I'm sure. Um, and I think we may have done another uh, joint purchase after that with the city of Toronto again uh, for street sweepers, but 2004 would have been the last time in that range when the city did it themselves. And as part of that um, joint purchase, or the joint assessment tendering. Toronto was the lead on it, uh, so they issued it. Um, we provided all our data for maintenance and reliability that we had, because we'd been, we had Tim Coe's, we had Joe Johnson's, and we had the third type, which name escapes me at the moment. But we provided all that too, as part of the study, and all that was taken into consideration in determining which was the best model to bring forward to our council and Toronto's council to purchase. And so you through Madam Chair, Rick, what year was that? Um, it, it probably, I'll, I'll, I'll find out and get back to committee on it, but it was probably around 2009-ish in that range. Thank you, Rick. Well, my comment to that, Madam Chair, is that that's still pretty much 11 years ago. And the car that I bought 11 years ago is not the car I would buy today. So I think we need to prove to the public that we are testing this on a regular basis somehow. And even if it's just confirming that that is still the case and, and the reasons why, but I think when you're coming to us with a single source and you're doing it because it's on a standardization list, you need to tell us and ex extend it out to tell the public why that is still the right answer. And it, and it may be, and I'm not questioning, I'm not questioning whether you think it is? I'm sure you do. I just think that, that, that we, we need to be assured and the public need to be assured that we're on top of making sure that something that we decided in 2006 or four and somebody corroborated in 2009 is still right 11, 10 to 11 years later. And so I'm just gonna leave that with you. I, I'm not asking you to 
to respond to it now, but I am asking you to take a look and consider the, the, the reality that something that was okay in 2006 may not still be okay just because it was okay in 2006 or 2009. And, and I believe that we need to have that in a report. I don't mean you need to necessarily come back with one. When you put a report forward that asks us to do a single source, you need to tell us that you've checked that out and it's still the best deal. I think Rick wants to say something, Madam Chair. No. no. Oh. Do you have a comment or no? I wasn't asking for a comment, Rick. I just thought maybe you were looking to okay. say, Thank you. say something. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to put myself on the list. I'm going to ask Councillor Clark uh, to take the chair as vice chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm also uh, consistently hesitant of single source, and I think I have voted consistently against it in every single occasion that has come in front of my docket, but on this one, I have a question. The, um, I did read about the extensive testing that was done in partnership with the City of Toronto. My question was, um, in terms of that model, are we aware of any uh, testing that has done, been done on any other models since then, in terms of the threshold that it provides? Through the um, I'm not aware of any recent testing that's been done. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess my, my comment is that um, we get a lot of information from public health and um, about air particulates, particularly in the, uh, in the lower city, and the vulnerability of, uh, of our children when it comes to those particulates. And even to those who are working, there's lots of evidence coming out about people who are working in buildings next to highways like this, and um, I appreciate the sensitivities on the cost and the due diligence that must be made, um, but on this one, um, the science that is coming through is telling me that there is no model and there has been no testing which improves the efficiency uh, of removing those particulates that are known to be a health hazard, particularly for our youngest residents. So. Um, this will be the exception to my rule. So on that basis, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so I want to preface my comment. I can only make my decisions based on the substance of the, the report. So what's in the report is what I have to make my decision on. So we understand that. So when I look at page three of four, the top paragraph, this is getting to Mr. Mayo's point in Second sentence, 2006-2007, Public Works, in partnership with the city, did the rigorous evaluation of street sweepers for PM10 and PM2.5. That's how we came to this conclusion that this sweeper was the best sweeper at that time. That's 14 years ago. I don't see anything in this report, Mr. Solda, I don't see anything in this report where there has been another evaluation to see whether or not other manufacturers have now improved the manufacture of their equipment to meet that same test. One would assume that if you're in a competitive marketplace over 14 years, you would have improved your product. We haven't tested the market. And if you have tested the market, you didn't share that with us. There's no documentation indicating that you reached out to six different manufacturers and they can only provide um, filtration for PM25. They don't get to PM10, PM5, or PM2.5. There's nothing there. So 14 years has gone by. We don't know whether or not the marketplace has changed. We don't know whether or not the prices have gone up because these people have a very clear sole source to the city of Hamilton and to Toronto to provide these sweepers. And we're going to negotiate with them when they know that we can't, they, we can't buy from anyone else. So it's hardly a negotiation. If I know I can't buy from anyone else, that's not really a negotiation. So it, it, it's troubling what's in this report. 
And then I have a question for Tina, because I believe Tina indicated something to the effect that there was a year left on the contract or something. Maybe I misheard that. Through the chair. Um, I have had conversations with Fleet, and, and my recollection is that uh, they were going to be bringing in the vendor um, to have discussions, but I can't say for certain if the contract allows for um, an extension of that contract, an optional year term or if they were looking to extend the contract past its final term. Can't be okay. sure. So based on the concerns that have been raised by this committee, can Mr. Solder or Fleet address that issue as to where we are with the contract termination and any possible extensions? Mr. Solder? Um, I'd like to, uh, to you, Madam Chair, to Council first, I'd like to address the, the first part of your, your, your previous comment. Uh, staff and fleet and, and transportation operations and maintenance have been testing these sweepers. And I'll refer to uh, page three, at the very bottom, analysis and rationale for the recommendation. Fleet planning section along with roadway maintenance section have investigated street sweepers in the marketplace and arranged for demonstrations of several sweepers of various sizes and configurations. The findings indicated that none of the sweepers met the efficiency standard of removing 90% of PM10 and PM2.5. Don't be a, to be a hazard. These sweepers that we're putting before you here today are the only ones that are meeting that standard. And that is the reason we, we're, we're presenting them as one of the main reasons as the sole source. In terms of your second question, I would have to follow up with Fleet Services in terms of uh, the remaining time frame on that contract. So what were the names of the companies that you reviewed then? Because again, the substance of the report, we don't have that. We have one sentence that said you've reviewed him. But earlier you referenced that, well, this is, you know, we made this decision back in 2006, 2007. So where's the, the evidence indicating, yes, we did review them, here's the names of the manufacturers, here's the outcome of the actual test. You see what I'm saying? We're, there's not enough substance to, to justify continuing a sole source without all of that information. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor, we can provide that, that uh, granular level of detail, if, if so required. Um, we felt that the uh, identification that we had investigated was sufficient at the time of writing the report, but we can provide for that. Uh, I do want to clarify that this vehicle only came on the standardization list in, in 2017. It wasn't standardized since uh, 2004 or six. You're specific to this one vehicle or this one model of vehicle, yet your report indicates that you made the decision to go with a Typeco Sweeper DST6 back in 2006. We first started, through you, Madam Chair, to the Council, we first started using them, and uh, further to the uh, explanation provided by my colleagues in uh, procurement, uh, the process with the City of Toronto, but I believe it only became on the standardization list in March of 2017. Let me ask you a very candid question. What prevents and what's the downside to the city of Hamilton? And I look to procurement also. What, what's the downside to the city of Hamilton issuing a procurement request specific to what you want to achieve in terms of PM10 filtrations and issuing it out to all the manufacturers and seeing what's out there? getting that information back. What's the downside to doing that type of competitive bidding process? We set our qualifications, we say this is what we want, and if you can't meet those qualifications, then we proceed as, as we normally would, but at least we've tested the marketplace. Mr. Bow, can you the chair. Um, the potential downside to that is that if in fact this is the only street sweeper that meets those specs, the manufacturer will know that, and they can put in as high a price as they want, and because it's a public tender, we're obligated to take it if we want a street sweeper. That's the only potential. And a, a slight delay in, in acquiring a piece of equipment. So how would they not know that since we've standardized the, pro the product? Haven't we already done that through a standardization, saying this is the only sweeper we're gonna purchase? 
Tina or Rick? Uh, through, through the chair, uh, we've, we've done that, but I'm not sure what the details are within the contract that I'm being told is in place. Uh, that may provide us with a percentage discount from manufacturer's list or, or some other thing that would give us protection in regards to pricing. Well, I would expect that the committee is going to support the, 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 the purchase of the, the single sole source. Um, but I'm going to suggest very strongly to staff that in the next round, you should be looking at a competitive process. Because I've not had anyone indicate to me that they've tested the entire marketplace to see whether another other product is available. And a limited number of searches on manufacturers in the area doesn't do it for me. That's not a competitive process. And if they know that we've standardized it, then you're going to have um, price creep up because they know we're going to be buying from them anyways. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, some of my questions have been asked, but I think the question that, that I'd really need to hear about is were we... Um, looking to purchase this street sweeper for the bike lanes? Were we looking to purchase it for this spring, summer, fall period? Uh, Mr. Soldo? Through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And uh, so if this does not get supported because it is sole source, what would be the next step? Implications, Mr. Soldo, of not uh, purchasing? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, we have a number of facilities uh, such as the Cannon Street bike lane that currently uh, is quite restrictive in terms of uh, space and getting in there. We would have to find alternative methods of uh, sweeping those areas. Okay, so that would be something you would do then. Would that also include investigating to see if there are other new products out there new manufactured sweepers that could fit the bill? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, we, we have looked at other manufacturers, and that yeah. is why we came back to this being a smaller vehicle. And I appreciate, I appreciate that because I, I think there's been some confusion around that. I've heard that you haven't, not from you, but I've heard that you know there wasn't an investigation done, there wasn't uh, looking at other um, manufacturers, and yet, I have heard a couple of times from staff that you have. I think the fulsome of the answer is not included in the report, and that, that is uh, perhaps what's problematic in this case. So thank you. Those are my comments. Councillor Ferguson. I think to move this along, I, I, I don't want to... I, I think it would go down today if we put a vote to it. I know I would vote no. Uh, but I think I'd like to get more information before I do a vote. So I'd like to move that we refer this matter back to staff for further information at the next meeting, including who else manufactures street sweepers and what dose, dose, uh, dust output do they, can they meet? Is it 25 or is it something different? Just so we have that information in front of us so we can stand up in front of the public and, um, and say that we did check this out. And uh, what size of machines do they provide to be able to go into these bike lanes because you're looking for a smaller sweeper. So I would move this be referred back to the staff or report back to a future meeting with that additional information. Uh, thank, thank you. So the rules are, I, I was going to speak in, uh, before you, Councillor Ferguson. That's my fault. I didn't. I can't speak to this now. A uh, referral? Okay. Um, okay. I'll, I'll try and do that. About the referral, um, I certainly don't want it to uh, go down, obviously. Um, I, <laughs> I wish we applied the same sort of rigor um, to our other project works, public works and roads that we did to this. And again, I would point to my colleagues um, that the operational and testing and expertise is in their hands of equipment. And it says very clearly that that testing and identification of different sweepers has been done on the bottom of page three and into 
four. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm a little beguiled at this, but I will go to Councillor Pearson. So, Madam Chair, my question was to the motion because the um, the author of the motion stated, I think, in the initial um, verbal was that come back at the next meeting, and now you're saying come back to the future. So, I just want to know the timeline of when you want staff to come back with comparisons in the industry. Okay, and I. I have no problem with that. Thank you. Rick Angela, did you? Oh. To the deferral? Yes. Councillor Partridge? So to the referral, um, we have heard now two weeks, I believe, for the, for the report back. And so my question to staff is, does two weeks give you enough time to bring the information back that's being requested? Through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to have a vote on uh, Councillor Ferguson's move to defer. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Peart Partridge, thank you very much. All those in favour? Councillor Vanderbeek? Thank you. Thank you very much. That motion carries to defer a uh, six to one. We are moving on to item 10.2. Councillor Pearson, did you have a question on the report? So this is really just going out to get information because it says we're not committed to anything. Is that correct? Madam Chair. Uh, through the chair. Uh, last uh, year, or I guess it might have been the end of the previous year, um, taxation issued a request for information out to the market for tax billing software. Uh, in response to that, we received uh, one submission from this company who were in the process of, of uh, modifying an American software package to meet the Canadian market requirements, the Canadian taxation requirements. We were also notified by the city of Mississauga that they had developed an in-house tax billing system that they were willing to sell, but they would not participate in any sort of competitive process being a municipality. We went and looked at the city of Mississauga offering. Um, staff were quite pleased with it, and it met a lot of the uh, deficiencies that were in the existing system that the city is using. Uh, however, there were some glaring uh, things that were not built into that system, such as being able to handle all the tax codes the city has due to uh, the, w the way that we charge taxes. Um, and uh, as such, it was also a very expensive system. As a result of that, we invited this company in to talk to us about what they were bringing to market. They're developing, as I said, uh, they're modifying some existing software to meet the Canadian market demands. Um, we checked and found out that, uh, you know, what they plan on putting into it, it is, would address the issues that uh, we weren't happy with with the existing system and we couldn't find another one that met those needs. Um, so what they ha offered Canadian municipalities is the opportunity to basically participate as a sort of beta site. They would provide us copies of their software. We could play with it and test it and give them feedback and then they would take those um, suggestions that we were providing to them and to improve their package, to build into reports, to build in spreadsheets, whatever it was that uh, the municipalities felt uh, would, would enhance the, the software. At the end of the process, we are not obligated in any way, shape, or form to buy it. Uh, having done the RFI, there's not a lot of uh, software out there right now, but there are a significant number of municipalities in Ontario that are not happy with their tax software billing system and are looking for replacements either in the near future or in the next couple of years. So we think that there will be uh, improvements in the market and other software might come to market. So at the end of this process, what we've recommended is that we'll come back to you and let you know what we found out and have options going forward, whether we wanna go out to market uh, uh, with a, a RFP and, and select a software package that way or whether uh, uh, there's other options on the table. I'm assuming that uh, as part of your uh, early adopter program, 
that if in the end you ended up going with them and they already have two Canadian municipalities that are happy with what's happening so far and they've actually signed contracts with them to implement it in the next year. Um, so we, we feel that uh, this is a, a, a no-brainer for us because it's going to take a bit of our staff time, a couple of hours a week, that we feel will be well worth the effort. Um, we, the existing tax software we have now, there's an awful lot of manual processing outside of the system. We upgraded it to the latest version, the web version, hoping that it would address the uh, manual inefficiencies and all the spreadsheets we had to do outside of the system, then load the results of those spreadsheets in to carry on with the tax billing process. Unfortunately, when we put that in place, those enhancements were not included in the software and it's still a very labor intensive process. In fact, we still have the old version of the tax billing running at the same time as the new version because we're not uh, uh, convinced that we should shut the old one off in case we have any problems with the new version. So uh, we'll be coming back to committee and council um, probably in the next year and a bit to let you know what we found and what's available on the market and bringing forward if we uh, feel that it's warranted a capital budget to acquire new software as part of the 2021 or possibly 2022 capital budget process. Thank you for that. And I just um, reading here. So Mississauga did an in-house. They had their IT um, do an in-house program. And we don't have technology here for our staff to do an in-house program. They had internal you, staff Tina. helping to develop it, but there's an external software vendor that they're working with who actually did all the development and is doing support. And that's one of the reasons why it's so expensive if you wanted to buy it from them because you do uh, it it's being sold through that third party. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Appreciate that. Councillor Clark. Thank you. So I'm comfortable with this. Uh, basically, it's a beta test for all intents and purposes. And um, staff have advised me that they're still running a shadow program. They're not, they haven't turned off my language, the, the the software that we normally use for, for taxation. So that is still in place in case the beta test fails or we have major meltdowns on a program because you, you don't know what, what it's going to do. So you're following through on the test while maintaining the other program. Is that correct, Madam Chair? Through the Chair, we will not be using this to do any tax billing of uh, residents in the City of Hamilton at all. It'll be strictly a test system that we're using to see where there are uh, some deficiencies or where there's some things in place that we really like. And when I read the report, um, it doesn't bind us in any way, shape, or form at this point. Correct? Correct. Excellent. Thank you very much. There are no other questions. May I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendations? Councillor Collins and Councillor Pearson. Electronic vote, please. That carries. Thank you very much. Um, on to item 10.3, follow-up to performance audit report, employer paid parking. Moved by Councillor Collins. Are there any seconded, seconded by Councillor Pearson? Any, and a comment? Or is yours? Oh, thank you. So thank you, and I want to thank uh, Charles and Bridget, everyone involved in this, because this has been a long historical, I noticed the number of reports, the historical reports, and I appreciate them being attached here, so we can refresh our memories on going back uh, over the number of iterations of the reviews that were done, and um, certainly appreciate where this is coming from, and um, you know the direction staff to see where we can find efficiencies and, and savings is uh, certainly not, uh, not to take away from this potential opportunity as well, and I am uh, supportive going forward. Thank you. No other speakers? An electronic vote, please. All those in favor or opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. We are on to motions right now. 11.1. .1. Compassionate grant for development charges to agricultural societies without a farm business Registration, Councillor Ferguson, I believe you have, uh, the, you can introduce your motion now, sir. 
Yes, I do, Madam Chairman. I have a motion uh, before the committee. And uh, before I get into that, I'd just like to recognize a number of members of the board of the Ancaster Agricultural Society are in the audience uh, waiting for this. I hope you weren't falling asleep through all that neat, neat tax stuff. But um, it, I'd like to officially welcome you here in the council chambers and coming down in such terrible weather. But the Ancaster Agricultural Society wants to build, which I believe is a 70,000 square foot show ring. And uh, it'll have about 100 stalls in it for horses and cattle and other things that they can um, show in the, in the barn. And uh, so we uh, wanted to get clear about what development charges will be. Agricultural, for quite a while now, has been, if not forever, I, I, I never went back to, uh, a long ways in history, but is exempt from development charges. And um, so we just wanted, we didn't to confirm, is this building gonna also be exempt from agri uh, development charges? And staff said no, and the reason was that during the last review of the development charges bylaw, and Councillor Johnson, uh, too bad she's not here today because she explained to me what happened where there was a concern amongst the committee that reviewed the DC uh, Act that they wanted to make sure only bona fide farmers are being exempt, not other commercial operations uh, around the city. And so they, they put a requirement in to be exempt, you must have a Federation of Agriculture number. Um, as we drilled down the Ancaster, well, no, none of the agriculture societies, and there's three of them in the city, can uh, get FOA numbers. It's something that's very guarded, something that's uh, very protected by the Federation of Agriculture. And so uh, I went to staff and said, uh, you know, this is clearly an agricultural operations for horses and, and other cattle and, and other uh, uh, farm animals. So it's clearly for farm use. And the agricultural societies are owned and operated by the farming community. And so uh, would you support me taking a recommendation that uh, all three fairgrounds be um, exempted from paying DCs? And uh, so Mike was very good and coached me through the process. He says, to do that, you'd have to open up the whole DC bylaw, go out for 90-day review, open up maybe a can of worms to get others involved. Um, and so his recommendation was that we do what we did before, is issue a compassionate grant uh, uh, for DCs, for all three fairgrounds, or all three agricultural societies, should they decide to put up a building. And... Uh, it's easier than trying to go back and open up the whole bylaw. So you'd simply transfer money from the unallocated capital reserve over to the DC fund. So it doesn't cost the city any money, just you move it to a different account. However, uh, he thought, and I agreed, and, and uh, the Ancaster Agricultural Society has agreed that should the property ever be sold and put into commercial use, that they'd have to reimburse the city for that. And, and the Ancaster Agricultural Society has agreed to that. Uh, both Brenda and Arlene are of the view that um, neither one of the fairgrounds are into su that situation now, but they very much could be, so we should treat them all the same. So um, I'm pleased today to go with Mike's recommendation, which is a compassionate grant, and move the money from the uh, uh, unallocated capital reserve to uh, develop a charge uh, reserve fund. And uh, the motion is before you, and I have a seconder in Councillor Vanderbeek. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I don't have any questions, I just have comments. Um, I want to thank Councillor Ferguson for bringing this motion forward. Uh, certainly the agricultural societies um, that are mentioned in this, in this uh, motion, um, you know, they've been in existence. Rockton, I think, is now up to 100, 157 years or 67 years around that area. So, you know, they've been an, an integral part of our community and building our community, um, y you know, even, even the former city of Hamilton, uh, which the city of Hamilton didn't actually become a city until 1846, and Rockton was already in existence at that time. So um, I'm just delighted to see this. Uh, there's no question that it is, you know, the work that they do for the farmers and for the agricultural community it's not just about having a fair once a year. It, there, there is so much more involved, and they really are the backbone of our uh, of our agricultural and rural communities, and and in fact for the city, they're a very important part of it. So I'm very pleased to support this. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you, and I, I want to thank the mover for the motion, and and thank Mr. Zagarek and his inimitable way of finding 
creative solutions to problems that pop up specifically when we're dealing with DC charges. Uh, it was a complex process going through the review. I, I chair the, the, the subcommittee that reviews the DC charges. Uh, I can tell the committee um, that it was never the intent of the sub-review committee nor of the committee or council to capture um, uh, the societies in the manner that it, that has been captured under the DC charge bylaw. Uh, it was a question of trying to ensure that um, we were closing a loophole that was being exploited by commercial operators on farmlands um, and that was um, why that proposal came forward. Councilor Johnson was very clear about it. Uh, but when we find these errors and, and we're in a box where we can't change it for five years because of the DC Charges Act, um, and if we did it now, we'd be opening up an entire public process in terms of hearings and everything else, and, and it's rather cumbersome. And so Mr. Zagarek and staff have come up with a solution that uh, avoids that issue, and then five years from now, when we now deal with the next DC charge, we can modify the wording in such a manner so that we no longer need these these types of grants. So I think it's a very creative solution. So I, my appreciation to the to staff and to Councillor Ferguson for coming up with it and fully support it. Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I'm not gonna reiterate everything that's been said because of course I agree with all of it. I just wanted to say that um, I too want to thank um, Councillor Ferguson for um, we're taking the uh, path um, least followed and, and going through uh, the process of dealing with our finance staff and, and Mr. Zagarek to find a creative solution for this to make uh, it work for uh, the agricultural societies. Um, and, and, uh, and of course, um, I just wanted to also say in Brenda Johnson's absence that she was 100% behind this as well. And so um, we recognize, of course, the value of those agricultural societies and the challenge um, that, that has been um, put in place by an effort to, to, to stop something that was happening and, and not recognizing the outfall on the societies. So I am really pleased to be able to second this and um, I'm sure that it will have support and I appreciate able to have just a couple of minutes to voice that. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Just quickly, I, I want to thank everybody for the positive comments. I was remiss in not recognizing Brian McMullen. He actually wrote the motion for me. It's Mike's idea, but, but Brian oh, wrote it. Mike's taking credit again, eh? <laughs> <laughs> And so I want to, in addition to Mike and the great work, a great suggestion he had, I want to thank Brian for helping putting the right words to it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. So through the chair, as we're sharing recognition, I just want to recognize Lindsay, who's sitting behind me as well, as Lindsay is our uh, in-house expert as it relates to DC. So just to make sure everyone gets appropriate recognition. Okay, so it's been... Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Ferguson and seconded by Councillor Parker. Oh, sorry. Councillor Vanderbeek. Um, all those in favor, please. Okay, thank you. General information business items. Um, we require an electronic vote to approve the item to be removed. May I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. Those in favor? Are there any other items of business? Mos motion to adjourn. Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Pearson. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming. <laughs>